Picture this, you are born into privilege, with a family deeply rooted in Massachusetts society and a grandfather serving as the governor of Michigan, you seemed destined for a life of comfort. However, fate had other plans. At the tender age of eight, you faced a heartbreaking separation when your father decided to leave the family. Your mother, undeterred by the challenge, relocated to Flint, Michigan, hoping to rebuild your lives. Little did you know, this upheaval would set the stage for an extraordinary journey. As a young man, you found yourself disenchanted with traditional classrooms, opting to drop out of high school. This bold move marked the beginning of your exploration into entrepreneurship. From the lumber industry to selling cigars, you honed your sales and negotiation skills, laying the foundation for what lay ahead. And in 1886, a fortuitous encounter with Josiah Dallas Dort led to the establishment of the Flint Road Cart Company, armed with a modest $2,000 startup capital. This seemingly humble venture would evolve into a multi-million dollar enterprise. The turning point came when you, driven by entrepreneurial zeal, ventured into the automotive industry. The company you co-founded would soon become the world's largest automobile empire, acquiring renowned brands like Cadillac, Buick, and reaping unprecedented profits. However, success was accompanied by challenges. A massive acquisition spree left you drowning in debt, leading to your departure from the very company you tirelessly built. Yet, your indomitable spirit refused to be crushed. Teaming up with Louis Chevrolet, you embarked on a new venture, determined to regain control of your automotive legacy. This is the untold story of General Motors and its resilient founder, William Crapo Durant. Durant's exit from General Motors had been a bitter pill to swallow. Forced out of the company he had built with blood, sweat, and vision, he watched as his empire slipped through his fingers. But Durant was not a man to be defeated easily. The setback only fueled his determination to rise again, like a phoenix from the ashes. He had a vision, a vision of creating another automotive giant that would rival the behemoth he had lost. His first endeavor was the creation of the Little Car, named after its founder, William H. Little. Durant's initial intention was to compete with the Ford Model T, which was rapidly gaining popularity. However, he soon realized that this approach was unsatisfactory and abandoned it. In the midst of this upheaval, an opportunity presented itself, a glimmer of hope on the horizon. Louis Chevrolet, a name synonymous with speed and innovation, had embarked on his journey in the automotive world. Durant saw in Chevrolet a kindred spirit, a fellow pioneer with a dream to build exceptional automobiles. In 1911, Durant made a fateful decision. With a loan of $52,935, co-signed by his trusted ally R.S. McLaughlin, he ventured into partnership with Louis Chevrolet, giving birth to the Chevrolet Company, recognizing the potential for greatness. J. Dallas Dort, a trusted partner and confidant, joined Durant in this endeavor, serving as the vice president and director of the Chevrolet Company. Their collaboration was marked by a shared commitment to excellence and a determination to challenge the status quo. Chevrolet's engineering prowess and Durant's marketing acumen made for a formidable combination. As the years passed, Chevrolet continued to rise. The company's cars, known for their performance and innovation, captured the imagination of the American public. In 1913, J. Dallas Dort took a step back from his role as vice president of Chevrolet, leaving Durant at the helm of this budding empire. But Durant's ambitions reached beyond the Chevrolet brand. He envisioned a return to the helm of General Motors, the company he had founded and nurtured. In 1914, a disagreement with Louis Chevrolet led to Durant buying out his partner. Undeterred, Durant approached R.S. McLaughlin in 1915 seeking to establish Chevrolet in Canada. By 1915, R.S. McLaughlin, a close associate and a trusted partner, had transformed Chevrolet into a powerhouse. Its sales were soaring. The venture proved highly successful for Durant. He strategically bought enough shares in GM to regain control. The stage was set for a dramatic comeback. 
With the support of shareholders and a new board of directors, he orchestrated a triumphant return to the helm of General Motors in 1916. The prodigal son had come home. During his presidency, which spanned from 1916 to 1920, Durant orchestrated the inclusion of the Chevrolet product line into the GM portfolio in 1919. He didn't stop there. Durant brought Fisher Body and Frigidaire under the General Motors umbrella, further expanding the corporation's reach and influence. But Durant's resurgence was not all smiles. In 1920, he faced the inevitable reality of losing control of GM once more. DuPont and McLaughlin shareholders, wielding considerable power, wrested control away from Durant. In a bittersweet twist of fate, he paid out a staggering $21 million to his friends and associates, relinquishing his grip on the company he had fought so hard to reclaim. Despite the adversities he faced, Durant's legacy endured. His audacious spirit and unwavering determination had left an indelible mark on the automotive industry. He had navigated the turbulent waters of business, built empires, and faced defeats with resilience and grace. The year was 1921, and William C. Durant was poised for yet another daring venture. Fresh from his departure from General Motors, he wasted no time in establishing a new automotive company, Durant Motors. The phoenix of the automotive world was rising once again. Durant Motors began with a single brand, but within a mere two years, it had blossomed into a conglomerate of several marks. Durant was back in the game, and he intended to leave an indelible mark on the industry once more. As he had done with General Motors, Durant embarked on a bold acquisition spree. He brought under his umbrella a diverse range of companies, each catering to different market segments in terms of affordability and luxury. At the lowest tier was the star, aimed squarely at the everyday person who might otherwise opt for a Ford Model T. Durant's own cars occupied the mid-market, providing a balance of quality and affordability. But Durant's ambitions didn't stop there. Much like his previous automotive empire, he meticulously structured Durant Motors to resemble General Motors, with tiers of cars competing at various levels of luxury. The Princeton line, a tantalizing prospect designed, prototyped, and marketed but never produced, was poised to take on the likes of Packard and Cadillac. At the pinnacle of the Durant Motors hierarchy was the ultra-luxurious locomobile, a symbol of opulence and grandeur. Yet, despite Durant's best efforts and his uncanny ability to create automotive empires, he found himself unable to replicate the monumental success he had enjoyed with General Motors. The 1929 Wall Street crash and the ensuing Great Depression cast a long, dark shadow over the automotive industry and the world at large. The financial woes that swept across the nation proved insurmountable even for a visionary like Durant. As the years passed and the economic turmoil deepened, Durant Motors faced an uphill battle for survival. The empire he had painstakingly built began to crumble, and Durant was faced with the stark reality that his latest venture was slipping through his fingers. In 1933, the once mighty Durant Motors met its untimely demise. The Great Depression had taken its toll and Durant's automotive dreams were shattered. It was a bittersweet end to a storied career, one that had witnessed the heights of success and the depths of defeat. By 1936, the man who had once been a millionaire was bankrupt. In the wake of the fall of Durant Motors and the financial hardships that followed, Durant and his second wife, Catherine Lederer Durant, found themselves relying on a pension provided by R.S. McLaughlin and other benefactors. Alfred P. Sloan, a key figure at General Motors, orchestrated a year pension for Durant, ensuring that he and his wife had some financial stability during their twilight years. But Durant was not one to sit idly by. He embarked on a new venture, a bowling alley and fast food restaurant in Flint, Michigan. Durant had a vision of family-friendly entertainment venues becoming a booming business, and he aimed to build a chain of 30 bowling alleys. He threw himself into the business, 
even working in the kitchen himself. In 1942, at the age of 80, Durant ventured to Goldfield, Nevada, with hopes of opening a cinnabar mine. He believed that the U.S. government might subsidize the venture through defense contracts, but this dream remained unfulfilled. Durant's determination led him to personally inspect the mine entrance, an exhausting journey that involved a challenging climb on foot. Upon his return to Flint a few days later, Durant suffered a stroke that left him partially paralyzed. It was a cruel twist of fate for the man who had once been at the forefront of an automobile empire. Forced to adapt to his new reality, Durant and his wife relocated to an apartment in New York City where he would spend the remainder of his days. Despite his mental faculties remaining sharp, complications from the stroke gradually robbed him of his ability to speak coherently. In 1946, Duran attempted to return to Flint, but his health had deteriorated to the point where such a journey was impossible. On March 13, 1947, at the age of 85, William C. Durant slipped into a coma from which he would not awaken. A few days later, the man who had scaled the heights of industry breathed his last. By the time of his passing, Durant and his wife had been reduced to bankruptcy, forced to sell off their collection of paintings and valuables to cover his medical expenses. He was laid to rest in a private mausoleum in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, New York City, marking the end of an era. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Until then, I'll see you on the next one.